I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. Hello, this is Peter. Hey, Peter, this is James Altucher. Hi, how are you doing? Good, Peter. Thanks so much for, for taking the time. I, I'm really excited for this interview. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Oh, no problem. So so I'm going to introduce you, but first I want to mention uh, congratulations. Your book, uh, we're, uh, by the time this podcast comes out, your book will have just come out, Zero to One, Notes on Startups or How to Build the Future. And Peter, we're just going to dive right into it. That's awesome. So, so... I want I, before I break. I want to actually like break down the title almost word by word. But before I do that, I want you to tell me what the most important thing that's happened to you today. Because I feel like you're like every other day you're starting like a Facebook or a PayPal or a SpaceX or whatever. Something. What happened to you today that you looked at? Like what interesting things do you do on a daily basis? Well, it's uh, it's every every. It, it, I don't know if there's a single thing that's the same from day to day, but uh, there, there's always uh, an, an inspiring number of great technology ideas, great science ideas that uh, people are working on. And so even though there are many different reasons that I have concerns about the future and trends that I don't like in, in our society and in the larger world, uh, one of the things that always gives me hope is how much uh, how much people are still trying to do, how many new technologies they're trying to build. Uh, um, you know, spent today uh, looking at a variety of uh, financial technology opportunities this morning, and met with uh, and, and was sort of brainstorming in that space, which uh, you know is an area that's uh, that where there's probably a lot of opportunity for reinventing what banks are, what uh, what, what finance does, even though it also has uh, the challenge that it's going to face more regulatory headwinds in the decade ahead. So what's an example? Like you got you were brainstorming. Like how do you how do you uh, run a brainstorming session? And 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 what does it mean? Well, I financial met, uh, technology. I met a guy who was a founder of another uh, of a finance tech company called uh, Wonga in the UK, which is a sort of payday loans business. And then uh, there's sort of a question, you know, what what we could be, what what one could do from there. And we just we just sort of we just surveyed, we just compared notes on uh, what we thought uh, was happening in the financial technology space and. Uh, and it was it was an extremely fruitful uh, fruitful conversation, um, and you know there's always sort of a question: what's working? Are there certain models that you can look at to copy? And then there's of course always a sense that 
once people are already doing things, uh, you have to uh, you you can't quite do it. So uh, the, you know one of the critical things in in starting businesses is is uh, is is this need to do something new, different, fresh, strange. This is sort of the zero to one ethos. Well, and and I want to I want to get to that. So your your point in the book, and and first off, just as as intro, I'm talking to Peter Thiel. You're the founder of PayPal. You're the first investor in Facebook. You've invested in I don't know dozens of other companies, including SpaceX, uh, Palantir is one of your biggest investments. Uh, all very impressive stuff. And the book Zero to One, I I feel it almost it it, it blew my mind. It almost turned up the whole uh, mechanics of starting up a company upside down. Because I think, as you point out in the book, and correct me if I'm wrong, you basically say that over the decades. Uh, entrepreneurs, particularly lately, have become more risk averse. So rather than come up with a completely new innovative technology, they want to incrementally improve on old technologies. And then just, I'm going to be extra cynical. Then they just want to kind of flip or sell their company and, and move on to the next one. And zero to one sort of says, look, we've got to, we've got to start with zero and build, build a monopoly so that this is how we take over the world. Build a monopoly and then scale it if you want to take over the world. Yes. Um, well, well, certainly my, uh, my book is an exhortation against incrementalism, against uh, small incremental businesses. You do not want to start the 100th online pet food company or the 5,000th restaurant in San Francisco. Uh, uh, extreme competition Extreme undifferentiation is not synonymous with capitalism. I think the, the, there's sort of many myths that I take on, but perhaps the biggest myth is this idea that capitalism and competition are synonyms. I believe that capitalism and competition are antonyms. A capitalist is someone who's in the business of accumulating capital. A world of perfect competition is a world where all the capital gets competed away. And, uh, and, and I think the, the greatest idea in business that does not get articulated is that uh, great companies um, do something unique, and because of this unique thing that they do, have monopoly-like uh, pricing power. Um, and uh, and uh, and and so, and so there's sort of a question: How can one go about creating a, a new business that uh, that creates a valuable monopoly for oneself and and for the rest of society? Because it, if you if you've done something new, it's uh, it also creates value for for all the consumers. And, and Peter, just just to mention, I feel like this is sort of a, a philosophical way to look at startups, but you can also look at like like Facebook, for instance, you can argue was an incremental improvement over other companies like MySpace and Friendster, but it started off as a monopoly on like Harvard students. So that's a, the monopoly way to look at it. Yeah, although there's always it's always a question of what counts as genuinely new. I would argue that uh, Facebook, genuinely solved the identity problem because it was about people's real identities on the internet. Uh, it was not about fake identities or alternate identities, which, you know, um, MySpace started in Los Angeles. Its core audience was uh, people in Hollywood who pretended to be someone other than who they were. Um, Facebook started at Harvard, and it was about people representing themselves accurately on the internet. And so much of the early uh, attempts at social networking had been about creating alternate uh, worlds, virtual realities in which maybe I'd pretend to be a dog and you'd pretend to be a cat and we'd sort of interact in some strange new way in this different medium. And uh, Facebook actually was the first company to mirror the real identities of the real world onto the, onto the internet, which gives it both its power, it raises some of the concerns people have about privacy because, uh, because it is so real. Yeah, so so it's interesting. Like a lot of the uh, interviews you've given in the past, you sort of say technology uh, came to a standstill, like in the late '60s. And and you and I are about the same age. You're about uh, three months older than me. And I, I sort of feel like when we were born, everything was finished. Like the highway system was done, plumbing was done, every all the tunnels and bridges were finished. Computers were made and they were just getting a little bit better every day. And, you know, even the Internet, like, you know, was sort of created around 1972 or so and then just got better and better, but nothing blindingly new. And, and you point out in one interview that, you know, even like Twitter is just a simple Web page, really. Uh, so so where do you think the next kind of um, huge technology innovations could happen? 
Well, I'm, I'm a little bit more positive on the history of computers and the Internet in the last 40 years. So I, I do think there's been a lot of innovation in that area. Um, certainly some of the foundational technologies were developed in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but I do think, um, I do think um, a lot of the applications, whether it's web browsers or search engines or social uh, networking sites, I would, I would consider as genuine innovations that have happened in, in, in recent decades. Uh, the story of innovation I, I tell is one that uh, we've been in a world where there was innovation in bits but not in atoms. And so um, we've had a lot of innovation in computers, not so much outside of information technology. So there's been less innovation in transportation or energy or even um, biotechnology, medicine, nanotechnology, space travel. All the futuristic technologies people envisioned in the 50s and 60s have done have done have done less well. You know, when one looks at the decades ahead from here, the straightforward prediction is to say that the computer revolution will continue, and I, I, I do think that's that's true. It's uh, it is not is it will continue to improve living standards, not as dramatically um, as one might hope. And so I think it's been a era of relative stagnation the last 40 years because we've only had computers and nothing else. Um, and then the, the more optimistic hope is that uh, we're, we will at some point uh, start to see uh, information technology, uh, bit, the world of bits, get reintegrated with the world of atoms and that we will, so that we will see things like uh, um, genomics where there's a potential of biology becoming an information science. And when we, when we think of biological systems as informational, we will be able to do far more than we could under the under the existing paradigms, or uh, like, like, like have, what? Like what? What does that mean, really? Well, um, <clears throat> well, if you if you think of a cell as a computer that can be programmed, there probably are all sorts of ways to uh, that one could program it to turn off diseases, to kill, to self destruct. If you have a virus in it, um, you could you could figure out. Uh, um, I, you know, there's sort of it would give us a mastery over biological systems analogous to what we now have over computational systems. And I think, uh, I think that's, that's a way that you could have tremendous uh, progress on some of these areas where, um, where a biotechnology has been relatively stuck in recent decades. So again, this is not, I'm not certain this will happen, but, but I think that's the, uh, that's the optimistic thing that, that could happen. I, well, I fundamentally, I fundamentally well, believe that the, the sort of slowdown we've had is not because we've run out of ideas or it's impossible to do anything new. It's not that nature is such that all the low-hanging fruit has been picked and there's no low-hanging fruit left. I think it is more of a cultural problem. It is that we are not trying as hard or we've regulated technology to death. Um, and, and so there was never any low-hanging fruit. It was always of intermediate height, and we always had a reach for it uh, to get to the next level. And I think we've not been uh, trying as hard in, in recent decades. And why do you think, not as a society, because I think a lot of your analysis is societal, but why do you think individually, like what, what, what qualities do we need to cultivate as an individual to reach for those intermediate or higher hanging fruit? Well, I, I think there are, there, are, there are a number of different ones, but, but certainly, certainly one that I, um, you, you have to be willing to persevere on doing something that's that's not conventionally seen as 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 um, as, uh, as working. You know, I start my book with this question: Tell me something that's true that uh, almost nobody agrees with you on. Uh, and that's like an intellectual version. But then there's you know what great business is nobody doing, or what what important research are people not working on? And um, and we've 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 somehow become very egalitarian, very incrementalist, where uh, we take our cues from other people around us, and we take as what is possible what other people are already doing, and and so that's where you sort of end up going in, in circles. Um, you know, this Silicon. One of the strange things in Silicon Valley is that so many of these successful entrepreneurs suffer from a mild form of Asperger's uh, or some, something like that. Um, and I always think of this as an incredible indictment of our society. What sort of society is it? where if you don't have Asperger's, you will pick up on all these subtle social cues that will discourage you from pursuing creative original ideas and that will tell you not to do it. So I think, I, I think that's, that's what we, uh, you know, I think we have the ideas, we have the ability to do them, and we, we can't let ourselves be uh, discouraged by the conventional 
uh, system which tells us not to pursue things. It's really funny because there's almost like an evolutionary psychology component to this, which is that we think incrementally because we're concerned all the time about status. So you're not necessarily concerned about your status vis-a-vis the alpha male. You're concerned about your status vis-a-vis the person who's directly higher than you. So you just want to make incremental improvements till you're directly higher than them, whereas someone with like an Asperger's like quality, their chances are they're going to be out of the whole chain and they're not going to have descendants his, you know, a million years ago. So, so these evolutionary characteristics we inherit now in in terms of our ability to invent, say, I mean, you you look at a lot of the people, even not just now, but a hundred years ago, people inventing things were totally, you know, outside the norm of, of conventional society. Yes. And and certainly, um, Certainly, the uh, the sort of the you know the 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 archaic context was one where you know you had like 150 people in a tribe, and so there's sort of certain certain uh, ways in which you'd be conformist, certain ways you'd deviate that make sense within 150 people, and we're now dealing in a global society of seven billion, where maybe um, maybe the 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 conformity of what the other millions of people or billions of people are doing is just overwhelming. And so, uh, and so I, th- I think maybe the, the calibration is, is very different. Uh, people, I, I, I do think, I, I think the communications revolution on the whole is a good thing. I think connecting the world is a good thing. But I, I wonder whether it has had this effect of, uh, of uh, discouraging people too quickly because you quickly get feedback. Someone else has already worked on this. Someone may have already thought about this. And when you get that feedback, uh, you, you stop trying. And so we, we have a, we're in a world full of anti-theories, of theories that tell you why you can't do things. And, uh, and so I think a lot, of, um, a lot of potentially good ideas get shot down a little bit too quickly. Well, I, I love one of your first rules where you, you're, you're describing kind of the, the opposite of what the conventional rules are. So you, you have four rules that are the opposite of the conventional rules. And one is... Um, where you know people should be encouraged to form a monopoly and have a proprietary technology, and you have what you call the 10x rule, which or what I call the 10x rule, which um, you basically say a, a company should start when they have a technology that's 10 times better than their, let's say, their closest competitor. So this way, they're so far ahead, it's almost like a monopoly. And I think that's a very powerful way to look at it. Just in in, in any in any in any meaningful dimension, certainly there's a technological dimension. You could say Amazon started with more than 10 times as many books as, um, as the next largest uh, bookstore. So that, that made it very differentiated and very unique. Um, uh, you know, and of course, when you have a real technological breakthrough, uh, then you just have something that didn't exist at all. So you could say the Apple iPhone was a smartphone that worked before mm-hmm. that there had been no smartphone that worked. So in some sense, that was infinitely better than what existed before on, on, if you define it that way. I wonder if it applies also not just, of course, to companies, but to anything to like, you know, if you write a book, it makes sure it's 10 times better than, you know, the other books in your category. Or if you make a work of art is is Andy Warhol 10 times better than the artist that came before him. And that's why he blew up so big. Uh, I wonder if that can, that 10 X rule can be applied to anything. Uh, I, 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 I think it's. I like to apply it in context where you could at least have an axis on which you can measure things. I think it's difficult to measure what makes art 10 times as good or, or a book 10 times as good. Uh, and so in something like art or writing, it's always a bit more qualitative. Right. Uh, but yes, I think, I think the, the qualitative version of the question is, is nevertheless important is, um, you know, how is this differentiated in a way that's, that's positive? What are you saying that other people are not saying? And if, if you're not saying something that's, that's, um, that's you know, meaningfully different from what other people are saying, maybe there's not that much point to it. You know, and, it, and it's interesting. What I, think, I really do think in the beginning of your book, what was so interesting to me was the way you, know, you posed the monopoly versus competition question. Like we're almost brought up to think that monopolies are not so good for society. And, and you come up with a, a really great argument that monopolies are essential for innovation. Because in, in a sense, a monopoly is kind of storing up innovation for competition in the future. And uh, uh, so that's why you're, you encourage people when they're starting a business. Obviously, you can't 
be a monopoly over the entire United States, but find your small market where you can be a monopoly. And I think that's a very powerful concept. Well, well, there's several different concepts. I, I think I think one one concept is is certainly that um, that if you're in a world of perfect competition, you will never make any uh, profits on on what you're doing. And so, <clears throat> so the key thing when you start a new technology business is to create something that has value to other people, and then to capture some fraction of the value you create. So you create X dollars in value, you capture Y percent of X. And X and Y are independent variables. And one of the, you know, one of the disturbing uh, things in science and technology is that in many cases, people have created incredibly valuable uh, things for society, but uh, they could capture no more than 0% of it. Um, this is true of a lot of science, a lot of basic science. But like biotech? Enough, you know, the Wright brothers came up with the first airplane, but they didn't make a fortune in, in air travel. Or um, Most inventors find it very hard to capture any fraction of the value. And so it's, uh, you, you really need to think about both how do you create something val valuable, and then how, how can you go about capturing uh, some, of the, some fraction of the value you create. Um, our, our legal system is very schizophrenic on this question of monopoly. On the one hand, it's seen as something bad that's to be regulated. And then uh, in other instances, such as with patents or intellectual property, it's something we actually celebrate and protect. Um, and I think, um, I think great technology companies are like um, – it's, it's the same idea as behind a patent or intellectual property where you're uh, doing something new. And so it's not – monopoly is not artificial scarcity, but it creates something new and therefore creates plenty where nothing had existed before. Do you think? Do you think part of the um, sort of stance on monopoly and competition comes from uh, the Puritan ethic that in order to um, get some value for ourselves, we need to compete in order to justify our reward? I, I don't. You know, I don't know if it's. I don't know if it's narrowly Puritan. I I think that. Uh, I think we. Uh, I, you know, the, the word already in the time of Shakespeare, the word ape meant both primate and to imitate. And so there is something very deep in, in the human, and you know, this is how we learn language, we, we learn culture by copying our parents, the people around us. Um, and so imitation is sort of very endemic to the human condition. And I think, uh, I think that uh, competition always involves uh, a lot of imitation because you're, um, the people you're competing with are people where you're imitating them, they want the same thing. You're trying to do the same thing as they're doing, and uh, and so I do think that's that uh, this this tendency towards imitation is 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 very very deep, um, and that's that's one of the reasons people are so attracted to competition. They they find it strangely validating. If, if you know you don't know what you want, you look to what other people want, you copy what they want. Everybody ends up copying everybody else. Um, and this is how you end up with the hyper-tracked education system where it's the most ferocious competition from K through 12 for all the same slots at the same few elite universities uh, later. Um, and uh, and that's, that's sort of a paradigm of, of, um, of runaway competition. Yeah, it's interesting because ultimately, like look at you, you went to Stanford, then you went to law school, and then um, – you didn't become a lawyer. Why, why compete against you know the billion other lawyers out there? Well, it was, it was certainly um, certainly my personal. I, I always like to say that I had sort of a rolling quarter life crisis from age 18 to 28, where I had been tracked in all these ways, and I gradually came to believe that the tracks were not the right things to do. And 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 probably the 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 the, the sort of the the really cathartic moment was when I worked at a large law firm in New York, where from the outside. Everybody wanted to get in because it was like it was seen as this prestigious job. You'd be set for life. And on the inside, people, uh, you know, everybody wanted to get out. People, but people had no idea what else to do. And, uh, you know, when I when I left after seven months, three days, one of the one of the people down the hall told me that uh, he couldn't believe I was leaving. He didn't have he didn't realize it was possible to escape from Alcatraz, which was odd. since You know, you only had to go out the front door. But uh, but psychologically, uh, people could not imagine anything else because so much of um, their meaning of their identity was defined around competing with other people. And were, were you and, scared when you walked out that door th uh, that last time? 
I was, I, you know, I was certain it was the right thing to do. But as I came into office that day, it was like, am I out of my mind to be doing this? Nobody quits their job this quickly. What will people think? Uh, like, were your parents uh, upset at you? My parents realized that I was very unhappy, and so they were, you know, they were, they were, they were confused, but they were, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't that upset, you know. But I think, I think it, um, but yeah, I, th I think in in most cases, uh, you'd be encouraged to continue doing this in in all sorts of ways that uh, that uh, are are probably questionable. And I, th I think if you sort of take this as a microcosm for our society writ large. I think the you know the crisis of 2008 can be understood as a point where tracked careers simply copying existing forms had somehow become exhausted. It had sort of run its course, and we're now in this very perplexing time in our society where there's a need for a reset. There's a need to do something new, and um, and we've not done this for I think 40 years in a way. Um, you know I think it's been it's been this increasingly tracked increasingly uh, static society for 40 years. And so the need to do something new is very perplexing, very strange. Uh, there's a way in which people are trying to do this in Silicon Valley. There are ways in which they're trying to do it in other contexts. But it's, uh, it, is, it is radically divergent from the way people have been taught as kids as, through college. And, uh, and so uh, it's, you know, we, we, we have, we're very schizophrenic on this. We, we celebrate entrepreneurship in theory. But in practice, uh, it's 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 not something uh, people really want to do. Well, and you know, you make this you you make this very interesting um, thought in the book that you know all these businessmen quote Sun Tzu's "The Art of War" all the time. But what they're really the reason they're really doing it is because of competition. But that's not real business. Uh, it's the competition that's like war, and business is more almost more cooperative. In some sense, like, you know, you, you, you know, one of the things that was really great about your career is not so much your particular arc, but then the arcs of all the people around you. So you started PayPal and then all of these ex employees of PayPal went on to form other companies. And so what what kind of characteristics of PayPal led to this <laughs> PayPal mafia? Well, it was, um, you know, it's, it's always it's always hard to know exactly what, what was in the DNA. Pay PayPal was probably um, the single um, the single company in Silicon Valley that produced the most entrepreneurs, the most startups, uh, with the possible exception of uh, Fairchild Semiconductor itself, which was sort of um, right. from which all the uh, great semiconductors came out and the, the companies came out in the late 60s and, and, and 70s, most notably Intel. Um, and, uh, and so PayPal uh, had probably... Of the, there have been something like seven companies started by ex PayPal people worth over a billion dollars in the like last. Which ones, uh, like which ones? Like like YouTube. Decade. What are the YouTube, companies? YouTube, Yelp, LinkedIn, Tesla, SpaceX, Palantir, and and Yammer. Uh, you, YouTube was the first one to really succeed, and then there was has been a whole series of them. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think there were were I think we had a very you know we 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 had a. Uh, we had a lot of strong personalities. We found a way for it to work. It was a, uh, I think the learning at PayPal um, was that uh, it was it was a tough business to build. We were we had a lot of competition, a lot of uh, regular, uh, it was a lot of regulatory challenges, uh, um, uh, but we sort of figured out ways to overcome them. And and so the the lesson at PayPal was that you could build a great company, but it was hard. It was not easy. It was not impossible. Uh, I think that when people come out of super successful companies like a Google or a Microsoft, um, it's often, they've often experienced business as too easy, and, uh, and then they're set up to fail. Whereas if you come out of a company that's completely blown up and failed, um, you often learn to lower your, uh, um, set your sights lower and your expectations lower. And so, uh, so I think failure um, is also somewhat overrated in our society because uh, um, you know it actually does damage people. So I think PayPal was this intermediate case where people learned that it was um, hard but possible to build a great business, and um, and and then you know the and then a lot of great friendships were forged, and uh, these were the bases for starting these new companies. Uh, one of the questions I always like asking people 
when they come in to, to start a business is, uh, is what was the prehistory? How do they meet? How long have they known each other? How long have they worked together? Because I think a, a lot of these great companies are not just solo efforts of a, you know, of a single a godlike person who does, does everything. But uh, there, there, are, there are small teams that, that really work together well. And, uh, and so the prehistory is important. Uh, you know, if you, if you met your co-founder, if you, you know, it's like, if, it's like uh, you know, if you get married to someone you meet at the slot machines in Las Vegas, it, you might hit the jackpot, but it's probably a bad idea. These things hmm. work often better when there's a reasonably long prehistory. You know, you're roommates in college. You spend years talking about how to build a company. You know each other's strengths and weaknesses. You understand the, the proper division of labor when you're, you're starting the business. You're able to speak to one another honestly about what's going on. And, um, and, uh, and I think PayPal provided that sort of a prehistory for, uh, for all the people who went on to start these companies. And, and you point out, like, uh, for, for employees and for co-founders and so on, everyone should know what they're doing. Like, it should be clearly defined what is your one thing that you're in charge of. And I think a lot of startups don't have that, and it gets very ugly fast. Well, it's the, uh, the, 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 the way I describe this is if you're a, if you're a psychopathic boss and you'd like the people working for you to fight each other for nothing at all, the, the formula for getting people to fight each other is to tell two people to do the exact same thing. And so, <clears throat> and so I do think, uh, I do think um, you get maximal cooperation when people's roles are defined in very differentiated ways so that, uh, so that um, uh, people don't see their success as contingent on someone else's failure. You will succeed if you do your job. Someone else will succeed if they do their job, and their job is different from your job, so you can both succeed, and it's not, it's not negatively uh, correlated from one, one person to the other. Um, in, in a startup, uh, it is true that the, the roles are very fluid, and so there is a tendency for uh, the roles to change. There's always a risk that they, uh, they shift in ways where they tend to overlap more. And so one of the critical things one needs to do as a founder or manager in an early stage startup is to continuously readjust the org chart, continuously redefine people's roles um, so that they remain differentiated all the way through. In, in large companies, the roles are normally differentiated, but it's normally just a sort of chronic bureaucracy where there's always sort of this low level unhappiness that's endemic to the organization. Um, startups tend to be sort of much more acute and manic, and uh, and and you need to be, you know, the ups are very high, the lows are very low, and you need to make sure that at the low points, um, you don't have everybody uh, th that it doesn't blow up like it might in a, in a primitive archaic tribe. Well, and part of that is because you're you're you mentioned in the book you're also hiring people you like and you want to spend time with. So to some extent, there's a a, a family or friend component to uh, recruiting that happens in a startup that doesn't happen in a large corporation. Yes, it's it's I I'm I'm in favor of working with with your friends. Um, I, I know a lot of people think that's a bad idea, but I I do think that uh, I do think it's critical to find people with whom uh, um, that, you know, you, it, it's, it's an intense period. And so you want to, it's, it's, it matters a lot who you're with, who you're working with, and you want, you want, you want the people to be fundamentally aligned and on the same page. And, and hopefully you can structure in a way where people will be even better friends at the end than they were at the beginning. And of course, this is where startups mirror kind of the the outside world of startups. Like basically, you should always spend time with people who are your friends as opposed to people you don't like. And applying, it's funny how big corporations forget this idea. And I think that's why, uh, as you say, it's endemic to corporations that people are kind of unhappy in general uh, at, at larger corporations because they forget that people just like to spend time with people they legitimately like. One of the uh, one of the rules I, I was I, I was told once uh, one of the observations was that you could predict employee turnover if if someone had three really good friends at a company they would never they would almost never leave if they had no good friends much more likely to turn over so I think one of the highest predictors of sort of um, losing talented people is whether or not they have great friends so I don't think you need to just hire people you're friends with or anything like that but I think 
hiring people that you'd like to become friends with or could become friends with is a uh, is a uh, is certainly a good question to ask. So 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 let me ask you this: when when Mark Zuckerberg first walked through your door with the idea of Facebook, and Facebook was obviously a small company at the time, he was a Harvard student. What what did you see? What what lit up your eyes? Well, it um, it was. You know, I mean, it was already scaling pretty fast. They had a, they were already at 20 colleges. They had 100,000 people. Um, <clears throat> um, all they needed was uh, money to buy more computers to get to more users. So, so it's generally a rule that uh, when all you need is computers, um, you need the money just for computers because you have so much demand. That's that's a that's 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 a pretty good investment. It was certainly a group of people that had been friends at Harvard for for quite a while. So you you had you did have that part of the prehistory. It was it was technically talented, which is not true of a lot of the social networking sites at the time. <clears throat> and so they were going to be they they succeeded in building it in a way that was scalable, which had been a problem with some of the earlier companies like Friendster. Um, and and so MySpace. It, 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 and so there were sort of a number of different things that uh, that checked out. Uh, I'm always, as an investor, I always like to ask the contrarian question. So the, the contrarian question for an investor is, you know, what, why is it that this is a great company? That wh and what do other people not see in this? Why do other people not see this? So, uh, so you know, the, certainly Facebook was was a great company since you know, it was it was growing like crazy. The valuation was reasonable, and the uh, and um, they only needed money to buy more computers because there was so much demand. I think people were missing it in the 2004 to 2006 period. Um, one of the biases investors have is always to just um, invest in things they themselves use. And so since Facebook at the time was a college site, and there are basically no investors who are attending college, it was uh, systematically underestimated, and how, uh, <clears throat> how intense the use case was was um, not appreciated by investors probably really until 2007 when Facebook – uh, was opened beyond college students to the larger public. And did did uh, did Zuckerberg already have a plan in place? Like he he knew eventually he was going to extend this to businesses <laughs> and then to everybody. Uh, it was, you know, I, I wouldn't say it was fully worked out in all detail, but but there was certainly this um, this extremely expansive plan from from very early on, and uh, and so you know it's. People always talk about these companies like it was it was random, it was unpredictable. We had no idea what happened. That's the politically correct way to talk about it. But I, I, I do think there was there was sort of a, a sense all the way through that, that Facebook uh, was the potential to be this incredibly big and incredibly important medium. Uh, the, the the most critical uh, decision I believe still in the, in the history of Facebook was in. July of 2006, when Yahoo offered us a billion dollars, and um, at the time the company had maybe still just college students. Uh, we had maybe 35 million in revenues, 40 million in revenues in 07, uh, in 06, and um, no profits. We had this board meeting on a Monday morning. There were three of us on the board: myself, Jim Breyer, another investor, and, and Mark Zuckerberg. And both Jim and I probably thought we should just take the billion dollars to be uh, to be fair Zuckerberg was 22 years old at the time he owned a quarter of the company uh, I started the meeting by saying you know this is going to be a 10 minute meeting uh, we we're obviously just going to turn it down you know the two of us then said well we should actually talk about this a lot a little bit more you know a billion dollars is a lot of money if you make 250 million there's a lot you can do with the money there's a at lot the age of 22 at the age of 22 there's a lot you can do with the money you can invest it you can do other things there's a lot that can go wrong with this company and, um, and, you know, Zuckerberg said, well, you know, I don't really know what I do with the money. I'd probably just start another social networking site, but I kind of like the one I have. So why would I sell it? And, um, and, you know, at the end of the day, he convinced us that there were a whole set of products that he wanted to build, which, um, which were not being valued in the market and, uh, and that we should at least uh, try to build those. And so if he did not have – had he not had this plan or this vision for the future, you would have just taken the money. You know, so, so I, money I, I, is pure optionality, and money is always – in a world where you have no ideas, money is always more valuable than anything you can do with it, and you'll always take the money. I see, but you're saying his ideas were enough to convince you that, hey, at the very least, I'm not, I'm, 
I'm going to be higher than a billion here at some point. Or we, or it's at least it's at least not a no-brainer. We should, you know, we we can give it another six months, see how it goes, um, and uh, and um, and I think and I think so. I think having, you know, if you, if you don't have that conviction about the future, you will always sell when you get offered that billion dollars. That's sometimes really, it's right to sell. Sometimes it's wrong, but uh, but certainly the feedback at the time, you know, and this again, this, this part of the history gets obscured. But in 2006, it was when we did not sell to Yahoo. It was uniformly negative. It was, you know, this is really crazy. This is what happens when you have a 22 year old running a company. Uh, we're looking forward to this company blowing up. It will serve him right. I mean, you had, you know, just articles seething with resentment. Uh, the, the articles still are seething with resentment. It's funny how like outrage porn sort of grows with the internet, you know, and, uh, on its on, uh, uh, you know, as as great as the internet is. But you know, l l let me put the numbers in perspective a little bit because you sold PayPal to eBay for one point five billion dollars. You made about fifty five or sixty million on that. And then if you had sold Facebook to Yahoo at that time you would have made a hundred million. So more than you would have made on the PayPal deal. How were you personally feeling? Were you scared that this was a risk you weren't willing to take? Um, I was, I was somewhat scared, but I, I, you know, I, I had this, um, I had this bias that, uh, you know, we, we had, we had named our venture fund founders fund. We decided we were going to, that we were going to be, we were going to back founders in what they wanted to do, and um, and I thought that uh, that maybe um, that you know at the end of the day uh, the right thing was to try to back the founder. I, I, you know the, the statistical way I got some reassurance on it was there had been there had been two other companies that had turned down one billion dollar offers from Yahoo in the previous decade. eBay had been offered a billion and had turned Yahoo down. And Google had been offered a billion and had turned Yahoo down. Those were the only two that had turned it down for a billion. And and so in both cases, those seemed like really dangerous decisions. They worked out. And so I concluded that uh, that probably the upside was 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 a lot more than the downside risk given given that given that history. You know, and and also again in in hindsight, of course, is great. But in, in your book, I like how you lay out very cleanly. You know, proprietary technology, network effect economies of scale and branding. And it seems like Facebook had all of those at the time. And plus, I'm assuming Mark Zuckerberg's ideas for the future had all of those. So it, gave, it made the decision easy using kind of these metrics. Yes, but you know, those, you, you, you don't need all four of those. I think if you just have one of those, you, have a, you can have a great business. Uh, branding alone is, is always a difficult one. Um, it's, it's, it's a real thing. It's something I don't claim to understand. So I, I don't like investing in companies that are nothing but a brand. Even though sometimes those things do work, um, but I think, uh, but I think the ones I tend to focus on are network effects, proprietary technology, or economies of scale. And um, and certainly, I like proprietary technology the most because that's that sort of is is, is the kind of thing you can really uh, uh, you can really understand from a science or technology perspective. Let's talk about the network effect for a second because this seems, in some sense, the most difficult because it's sort even if you have a great technology. <laughs> People don't really know if something's going to go viral or not until after it's gone viral. Yes. So, so I think network effects and virality are are a little bit different. Vi virality is a growth mechanism where the customers just bring in more customers. Network effects are where the value is driven by the fact that you have a number of other people inside the network at a given time. Uh, network effect businesses are extremely valuable. Um, the paradox is that they're very hard to start because – if you have something where you have a network, there's always a question: Why is it valuable to the first person? If you know, if it's really valuable once you have a million people, how will right. you, how will you ever get the first person, the first ten, the first hundred, and and get to a million? And so, so a lot of great network effect businesses end up starting with a new kind of service that can emerge in a fairly small context. So Facebook. The initial market was Harvard University. It was 10,000 people, and you went from zero to 60% market share in 10 days. And and then you had a network among just that, that tiny community. And so you started really small, and then you um, replicated it at other colleges, and then gradually 
gradually expanded uh, expanded from there. Um, and and because a lot of these network effects start very small, um, they're not the kinds of businesses people with MBAs are inclined to try because they look too small at the beginning to be any good. Um, and so if you, if you go after, if you go for a super big network effect on day one, you'll never get it uh, started because you can never get an, you can never get the critical mass of all the people on board. Um, if you go for one that's really small, um, that's what that's what actually works. Although it it doesn't fit sort of the conventional business metrics. People, you know, if, if you'd pitched Facebook pre-launch, it would have been well, this is, it's just for Harvard students. This is way too small. It's never going to be a real business. And uh, and so uh, they often get started by people who are really inspired by certain ideas rather than ones who are um, financially driven or want to make a lot of money. Well, it's interesting because you could say Facebook had as this umbrella, this bigger vision of let's connect everybody via identity. It's almost like Facebook replaced personal web pages with face, the people's p Facebook pages. And in a similar way, you created the network effect with PayPal using, I think, two, two ideas. One is this vision that transactions can happen uh, online through, through email or, or initially Palm Pods. But the other is you simply paid $10 to everybody who joined. Um, uh, well, it, well, certainly, um, certainly the, uh, the, the PayPal version of this was that we, we had to sort of accelerate the growth and, uh, and you, you try to, you, you had a viral growth driver, you had, uh, you pay $10 for everybody who signed up, but then it turned out there was this uh, network effect among, um, among, uh, uh, power sellers and power buyers on eBay, which in late 99, early 2000 was still a tiny group. There, were, you know, there were maybe 20,000 major sellers and you could get to 25, 30% market share in three or four months. And so, right, so oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. And so again, uh, it was, um, you know, the, the great, a good, you know, if, if you're trying to create a monopoly, you can define a monopoly as a, um, as having a large market share. And so how do you get a large market share as a startup? Because every startup necessarily starts very small. The answer is that you have to start with a small market. You know, uh, Facebook started with Harvard. Uh, PayPal started with eBay power sellers. These are these are uh, themselves quite small markets. Amazon started with books, so not that big a market either. And you sort of, and then you can, then ideally you can build the market out in concentric circles. When I see a PowerPoint presentation in a pitch where it starts with, um, this is a market that's measured in hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars, that's very bad because it means you will never get to a large share of the market. You will always be this tiny fish in this vast ocean. Um, and that's in some sense, uh, you know, I think there was a lot that went wrong with clean technology in the last decade. But, uh, but from a business strategy perspective, one thing that went wrong with almost all the companies was the markets were way too big. Every PowerPoint, every clean tech presentation was the opposite of Facebook. It started with a market that was enormously big, and we were going to get a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of this pie. And, um, and uh, you ended up just having enormous unpredictable comp competition that wiped you out. I, I always call this the Chinese refrigerator rule. So somebody comes in and pitches and says, look, we've got this, we've got this brand new kind of refrigerator. And if just 1% of China buys it, we're going to be billionaires. And I've never seen anyone succeed with that kind of argument. Yeah, because if 1% if of China buys it, then there will be 99 other Chinese companies for the other 99% of China, and they will drive the marginal... Um, you know, the marginal uh, profits to zero. What about something like Uber where, you know, it's a, it's, they start in San Francisco. So it, 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 it it's a small market where they're going to try to get large market share, but you can look at regionally other companies could start up in different regions. Like how do you deal with a, a pitch like that? <clears throat> Uber's, um, Uber's a complicated case. Uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's certainly, I, I'm, um, it's it's certainly one that uh, we we missed. Um, I I would have, my my bias is always not to invest in companies that venture capitalists themselves are prone to use, and so I suspect mm. that the venture capitalists are overvaluing Uber 
and undervaluing something like Airbnb because Uber is um, is sort of a town car service. Airbnb is um, you know uh, is still largely a, a cheap way to to stay in a in a hotel, and so the investor class is is likely to overvalue Uber, undervalue something something like Airbnb. But yeah, it's it's a Uber's a complicated one to analyze on this, but it, it certainly it certainly has some elements of this uh, of this monopoly uh, of this monopoly business in place, and uh, and I think it's fully priced into the into the market at this point. Yeah, I think the last valuation on the pr- private transactions were about was about nineteen billion. So yeah, I mean, it's again, high. I don't, I don't think that number itself tells you that it's overvalued or undervalued. I, um, and you know, people often, you know, the bigger the numbers are, sometimes the more undervalued it is because people will will react and say the number's so big that's ridiculous. It was only this much, so much, so much more than it's it was a year earlier. Uh, and so we, you, 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 you have to be careful not to base it off the the actual valuation. But I think um, I'm. I think it is the kind of business that uh, venture capitalists and other investors understand a little bit too well for my comfort. You know, which which is related to the discussion of of bubbles, and you talk about it a little in the book. But you know, in in the late '90s, you know, PayPal was was starting up, and you also have the sense that there's a bubble that's starting to happen. And I would argue there was never a tech bubble, but it was just a financial bubble. So we, we had this like IPO bubble in late 1999, early 2000. But the tech bubble itself sort of came true. Amazon did become the biggest seller on the planet. Google did become the biggest search engine. Um, you know, it seems and like the internet there's a- certainly the internet as a whole certainly uh, grew largely in line with the predictions of the late 90s. Right. So it seems like it seems like. Being it, when everybody starts saying bubble, they're probably saying it like like housing bubble um, occurred. The, the the phrase housing bubble occurred several years before there was actual a financial bubble and all these kind of mortgage backed obligations. So it seems like you can take advantage of when people start throwing the word bubble around. You know, I I'm always um, yeah, I, I would say that um, I think. I, I do think we've had this very strange history of these different bubbles over over recent decades. Uh, it was set, they were centered on different things at different times. So there was a they were centered on the new economy in the 90s. They were centered on finance and housing in the 2000s. I think we have today. I think we have a government bubble that's centered on a negative real interest rates, um, and uh, and so probably and and it's very odd because it probably you know it probably means you know. The, the things that were at the core of the bubbles, you you had to be careful about. Uh, you had to be careful about tech in the 90s. You had to be very careful about housing in the last decade, and perhaps you know you should not be keeping your you know retirement savings and government bonds at this at this point, um, because that's that seems like it's the center of of, of the of the current one. Um, it's it's um, I, I do th- I do not think we have a bubble in technology today. I, I think the bubbles. Uh, required the involvement of the larger public. They, you're, you're quite right. They went on longer than than people thought. So people were talking about a tech bubble already in '97, '98. It went on for much longer than that. Um, but I think um, you know I think there's no tech bubble today. There are not nearly enough IPOs. The public is uh, is is much less involved in this than it was in the '90s. Um, but it is it is it is certainly this you know it's 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 this phenomenon where when people Substitute other people's thinking for their own, and uh, that's that's when I think you get uh, you get a dangerous bubble. And so, housing had that characteristic in the middle of the last decade, and uh, there there are probably other other forms of it uh, today. I, I I do think it's uh, it's been sort of the the great uh, macroeconomic truth of our era has been these 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 strange series of bubbles and busts. Um, it's important to to try. It's been important to try to avoid. But probably the opportunity there is that this the, it's these this uh, boom and bust cycle that have, has made people more and more risk averse, uh, going against your sort of idea of uh, let's create uh, something different, something that's like a monopoly versus something that's just an incremental improvement that's a little safer. Well, certainly with respect to the internet and computer technology. Uh, there's a case to be made that we are still suffering a hangover from the 90s, and that uh, that after after the the collapse of the dot com uh, boom or bubble, uh, 
um, from since 2002, we've had a we've had a 12 year long boom in technology, and people have not believed it all the way through. And so I I, I do think that it's in the aftermath of these things that uh, that probably uh, um, you know probably the, the great internet investments have all been made in the last decade. They were not in the 90s. They've been in in the 2002 and 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 on period. And so, so uh, you know, it sort of leads to two questions. You mentioned that we're we're probably in a government bubble. Where would you put your retirement money at this point? <laughs> um, it's quite it's quite hard to say what to do. There's there's probably I still I, I I suspect that like the last bubbles, this one still has a ways to run. So it probably still has a few more years. A few more years to go, um, and uh, uh, you know, I think the the tag word for the it's it's a more pessimistic bubble. The one in the 90s was the new economy, the 2000s was the great moderation, the 2010s is secular stagnation, which you know, as, as Larry Summers has somewhat disingenuously explained to people, uh, means that you'll have negative real rates forever, and uh, and paradoxically it becomes a, a reason for the stock market to um, go relentlessly higher. And so I think we've just started talking about the secular stagnation theme, which is which is the sort of strangely pessimistic way uh, the current bubble is getting uh, dressed up. And I, I, I think you're right. It will, it will go on for, for, for ways longer. Probably uh, equity markets will outperform fixed income. And I think the strange ending of this bubble will be that it, it will be the one where you should not be in fixed income. And every bear market in the U.S. in the last 35 years, the correct thing has been to be long fixed income. Shorting stocks is always hard. Going long fixed income has been much easier. And I think at the end of the current bull market, um, you do not want to be in fixed income. And so you want to be in in, in other things. Um, the, uh, the, the, the way I the, – the macroeconomic way I frame it is that the two big – the two big trends that I see in this decade are a war on cash and a war on credit. The war on cash involves these negative interest rates, 0% uh, nominal rates, negative real rates, it's a quantitative easing, all the central banks printing money. The war on credit involves um, not allowing the banks to lend all this money out that's being printed, tightened regulation, the Basel III stuff, uh, Dodd-Frank in the U.S., the war on cash and the war on credit to a first approximation cancel each other out. So the government's printing a lot of money, and it's prohibiting the banks from lending it out. But uh, the nuanced thing is I think you want to be far from cash and far from credit because that's what war has been declared on. And I think the war will go on for a long time. So the, and that's, that's, the, that's, why I like, that's why I like venture capital. It's not, I don't know if it's an asset class for everybody, but, but personally I have probably – you know, 80% of my net worth is is in um, venture capital, startups, things of that sort, because it's very far from cash, and it's very far from credit. It's not levered, and it's uh, it's it's not cash-like. I mean, maybe you could argue some. You know, even though there hasn't been a lot of IPOs, like some tech definitely is is going to ride further in the next decade. Uh, some biotech, possibly. So you know, perhaps that's a way to to fight the war on cash. Yeah, so I, I, I like I like companies that are extremely opaque and not measurable at this point. So uh, so um, so you know unlevered companies are ones where you have no idea what's going on. And biotech is probably the most unlevered sector. Um, and so it's we're in, we're in a world where people probably overvalue things they can measure very precisely, and the things that are hard to measure have been undervalued and they have outperformed for some time. This is you know Google's outperformed. Amazon is a strange company, but it's it certainly has outperformed in, in, in large part because people said they had no idea what its value was and therefore um, they systematically underestimated it for quite a while now. So it's interesting, you know, in the beginning of the interview you you, you mentioned today you were looking at um, the comparing notes on a financial technology related to the payday loan industry and the payday loan industry, of course, uh, fights that war against lending. Like it's a, it, it's this, it's a, a, a massive, uh, kind of alternative banking industry that, uh, maybe a third of America makes use of, uh, because of, uh, the, the difficulties in traditional banking. So, um, 
do you find yourself looking at alternative banking systems? Yeah, well, we're we're, we're looking. You no, know, we're looking at all. I, I think it's an interesting area to look at, um, with the one big caveat that it's it is a sector where um, you're fighting this this regulatory headwind, and that's 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 something one should not underestimate, and it's especially problematic for startups because regulations are always uh, disproportionately tough on on smaller companies. And so I think I, th I think you have a you have an industry that's static that that needs to be rethought in one way or another. Uh, at the same time, um, um, at the same time, it's also an industry that's getting regulated more and more. And so, so it's an area we're looking at, but but we're we're still fairly cautious about. What about with biotech? I mean, I, I liked in, in the book, um, you mentioned um, the opposite of Moore's law, which is E-Room's law, where uh, drugs approved per billion dollars, you know, goes in half every nine years since 1950. So biotech, even though it's sort of hard to understand, there's this kind of negative government regulation aspect that is is driving up the cost of uh, drugs approved. Yes. Um, yeah. So certainly biotech has been in a it's been in a bad zone, I would argue, for 20 years. Um, <clears throat> I think there was there was a boom in it in the, in the 80s and early 90s, but it's probably been a 20-year-long um, period of, of underperformance. Um, the question, you know, I, I think the the regulatory question. I, I'm 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 always interested in it just from a contrarian perspective because it's like it's even more out of fashion now than say clean tech is which i think is also actually worth looking at since it's it's crashed probably 90 to 95 percent from from the highs in 08 and biotech mm -hmm. is even more out of fashion i would argue than than clean tech in in 2014. um it's um the 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 regulatory story that uh that i i think is worth thinking through is are we at a point where the fda is going to have to be less tight because you know we've been in a world where the FDA has had um, has had a um, an iron grip not just on drugs in the U.S. but really worldwide because you've had this worldwide deference to the FDA by all sorts of other countries and so you know so it's always this odd thing where the U.S. is just 23% of world GDP but yet the U.S. FDA has somehow um, been the gating agency for drug approval worldwide. And there is, I think, this question whether um, we are going to see some real alternative markets created in China, maybe with medical devices in India. Will you start to see medical tourism? Is there going to be more regulatory arbitrage in this? And, um, and will the, even just the, the mere prospect of regulatory arbitrage uh, push the FDA to be less restrictive? And so, <clears throat> and so even though you're dealing with incredibly tough regulations in the biotech space. Um, the the bullish case is that I don't think they can get much worse. And I think it's always you want to look yeah, at not, and, the, and absolute, the, it's not the absolute level of the regulations, but it's the first derivative. Are they getting worse? Are they getting better? We have regulatory headwinds in finance, in biotech. I think it can't get any worse, and I think there is a case that it it may get better, although it may take a while. Yeah, and also the the aging population would suggest that ultimately the FDA has to approve more drugs. People are going to demand it. That that's what would happen in a in a rational society. Of course, you know the the, the worry would be that an aging population becomes even more risk averse, even more scared, even more willing to um, um, allow uh, regulators to do stupid things. Now, so so in in the book, one chapter that I really liked was was titled "Secrets," and it's sort of like this idea that. There are things that are completely unknown and that are kind of secrets to us as a society, but the individuals who uncover those secrets will be able to build monopolies around the businesses they start uh, 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 based on what they discover. So, so this kind of veers in a different direction, but you know, you, you approach this again from a societal standpoint, but what individual characteristics can someone develop now uh, to help them uh, basically be able to uncover secrets? Um, well, I, I, I think a part of it is just to have a, uh, a passion for certain ideas. If, you're, if, you're, if there's a set of things you are really interested in thinking about, it's you, you keep working at it. And, um, and I, think, I think we are in a – I think the, the larger point I like to make in this chapter is just that there are a lot of secrets that exist. So there are a lot of things we could figure out if we worked at it. Um, it's not, um, 
And so I think one, you know, there's this, uh, there's a self-fulfilling part of this where if you believe that there are secrets to find, then you will work at them and you will be someone to find them. If you do not believe there are any secrets, if you think everything's been discovered um, or is impossibly hard for you to figure out, then you won't figure things out. So I think there's a big self-fulfilling prophecy aspect uh, aspect to this. Uh, you know, the, the example I give in my book is a, a, a of Giles, the, uh, the the Princeton mathematician who proved Fermat's last theorem, and um, you know he he spent close to a decade working on this, but he believed he could prove it, and that motivated him to work on it and to ultimately ultimately prove it. Um, and so it might have it's hard to know ex ante whether it's possible or not, but if you didn't think it was possible, um, if you didn't think it was possible for you to discover something new, then you would never be the person to discover that that new thing. Right. So let's say that's step one. So let's say, for instance, I believe I could be an Olympic level uh, javelin thrower. I'm going to start I working. Like, I don't like that example because that's too that's too conventional. And we can we can we can probably measure your abilities and we can figure out within 30 seconds whether it's even within the ballpark. But 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 sure. Well, which yeah. is not, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. Which it's not, by the way. I can't be, but I, I'm just giving as an example because, like, take the example, the Princeton example with Fermat's theorem. Um, <laughs> he clearly knew what direction he should work in to to solve this secret, or he had an idea, a rough idea. How could people cultivate within themselves the ability to even work beyond the step? Let's say they're optimistic and they believe they can uncover secrets, or they 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 buy into the idea that there's secrets to be uncovered. How can they still cultivate these personality characteristics to to work further at it? Well, I think it's I think the starting point is that one is um, extremely passionate about some set of ideas or some approach to doing things, and it's um, it's best for it to be something that's that you know if it's something where you have a lot of very talented people working on it already this may be more difficult so i i do think it's probably hard to discover secrets in super string theory unless you're you know a first rate mathematician or physicist um but i think there are i think most fields are not like physics they're not like mathematics they're they're actually uh, ones where the frontier is relatively nearby and uh, and it it requires um, it just requires you to uh, to uh, to really uh, approach a problem in a slightly different way and 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 you know one one shortcut that I've often used is to look at um, you know what are things that are conventionally believed what are things where everyone's focused on approaching a problem in a certain way um, and so you know we have um, you know. Like I, th I think it would be, fat, I think an incredibly important problem to work on is finding a cure for Alzheimer's, and um, there's a conventional approach that I suspect is way overexplored, which is around beta amyloids, which are these plaques that build up, and um, um, they seem to be a marker. It's not at all clear they're causally connected, uh, and there are many other approaches that uh, do not involve that. And so, um, so as a starting point. Uh, if one were working on this problem, you'd look at you'd try to look at something where, for some reason, people had not explored it and that was promising. And um, and uh, if it's something that's conventionally explored that everyone says is the way to go, that's probably very crowded. That's not a very promising one to look at. It, it seems like in your career, you what you've done a lot is combine areas. So for instance, like take PayPal as an example, email was a, a kind of well-covered area, but then the idea of doing transactions online was still very scary in the internet. Yes. And by combining them, you were able to yes. develop a whole new industry. Yeah, I, I certainly think anything interdisciplinary in our society is is quite underrated. You know, we we're, you know, I've talked at length about the sort of education bubble and I'm sort of a high a, a, a critic of a lot of what's been going on with the universities in our society, much much like I believe you are. Um, but yes. I, I think uh, one of the things that's very perverse about the current university system is that it pushes people towards arcane specialization, and anything interdisciplinary is seen as very bad. And I think people avoid interdisciplinary fields in college because they end up stepping on lots of people's toes. And so it's always seen as politically dangerous. But, uh, but I think a lot of the interesting ideas will come from the intersection of, you know, computer science and biology. This will be 
the next uh, revolution in genomics or the intersection of computer science and transportation. And this will be companies like Uber or Lyft or, you know, or maybe the self-driving car. Um, and so I, th I think um, I think these sort of intersection fields, these interdisciplinary fields, are uh, are extremely fruitful uh, areas to explore. You, you know, and it's interesting too with like with like Uber. You have it's not just that it's a car service, uh, but it's a it's a logistics software where you have this labor force, and then on the other side you have a demand for this labor force. So right now they use it for cars, but they could also use it for doing your laundry or whatever. So uh, they, they, yeah, oh. no, it's 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 um so yeah, no, it's it's a it's a yes, it's a complex logistics problem, and then applied at least initially to this very specific, um, you know, uh, a building a um, two-sided market of both uh, drivers and uh, and passengers um, on a city by city basis. So so. So, Peter, I have, I have two final questions, and I also want to kind of, again, um, tell you what I think of the, the book. But the one final question is, um, obviously, in the, in the show Silicon Valley, the Peter Gregory character is nothing like you, but is clearly based on you, particularly his anti-college stance and, and, and so on. What, what did you think of that when you first saw his character on the show? Well, you know, it's... it's, it's uh, I, I actually think... Um, I think, I think it's on the whole, it's actually kind of flattering. And uh, did they I ask the you? Show, no, they, they never ask. They never ask. Of course not. Um, uh. um, you know, the, the claim is that it has no connection with me, and so, so of course they, they would, they wouldn't ask. But, uh, but, uh, but no, I, I actually think the show did a, did a, is, it, did a. Uh, I, I, I think it was, it, it was very well written. It was funny. Um, I don't think it was that hostile to Silicon Valley. And I think it certainly gets interpreted at this time as as quite positive. You know, the social network movie was much more negative in intent, um, but even that uh, got seen as a as a positive, inspiring movie. People, it was meant to, uh, it was intended to make Mark Zuckerberg look bad, but when people in Silicon Valley watched it, they saw, wow, it was impressive how hard Zuckerberg worked, how passionate he was, and that's really inspiring. And so I think we are in this cultural moment where. Um, all these things about Silicon Valley um, will be given a very positive valence, and I think uh, I think Silicon Valley show is generally positive. Social Network was meant to be negative, but it's like the Oliver Stone movie uh, Wall Street, which uh, he meant as an attack on Wall Street, but it actually inspired all the investment bankers in the 80s. Right, right. That's very true, actually. A lot of people sort of looked up to Gordon Gecko, despite the fact that he was a clear criminal uh, by the end of the movie. They, at they least just in Oliver Stone, five minutes before the end. It was when everyone was celebrating and they, before they went to jail. And, uh, and yeah, uh, and, and Stone said, you know, he'd wanted it to make it a, an anti-Wall Street movie, but, uh, but people, uh, people thought Wall Street was a good thing in the 80s and 90s, and so they interpreted it positively. And I think we're, we're in a point in time in history where people are looking at Silicon Valley in that, in that sort of way. And so I think, I think all these cultural representations are, tend to get interpreted in a, in a really positive way. So the the other question I have is so you're you and I are both uh, ranked similar in chess. You're, you're a, a, a chess master. We're we're around the same age. How do you feel? I, I I know what it takes to get to that rating in chess. There was there's, there was a lot of work involved when you were younger. How do you think that translated into your later success? You know, it's 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 always hard to know exactly how it translates. Uh, I mean, I is because I think chess is always a little bit of this unique uh, combination of art and a science and a sport, some sort of weird intersection of those, those three, so those three things. I, I do think, um, I do think it, there are sort of chess metaphors I like. There's, you know, there's a, the, the Capablanca metaphor that, you know, you must begin by studying the end game that you, you want to think about where you're going in business. Uh, you know, uh, whoever moves, it's the first mover, in chess is white, and white gives you about a one third of a pawn advantage, which is a t so you have a tiny edge by moving white by going first. But the last mover, the person who says checkmate, uh, that's uh, that's really decisive. And so I think, in in business as in chess, uh, you want to think about um, you know, being a first mover is a tactic, uh, being a last mover is, is is the goal, and that's 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 a that's a worthwhile thing to think about. So I think there are all these these ways that it uh, it carries over. I um I. It is um, 
I do think that uh, um, you know I, I do think it's a it's an incredibly beautiful game, um, and uh, it's uh, I, I, I worry that it has its its uh, cultural valence has gone down some as a result of computers getting better than people. Uh, people with uh, Deep Blue beating Kasparov back in 1997 is sort of a, a key turning point, but I still uh, still really enjoy playing uh, playing occasionally. Yeah, no, I I tend to play online probably at least 10 games a day. It's a it's an addiction. I'm addicted to the Internet Chess Club. Yeah, uh, I helped build the Internet Chess Club back in 1992. Wow. So wow. I'm, it's, it's probably I'm one of my biggest addictions. Yeah, I'm a little bit. I'm your drug dealer. <laughs> so. So Peter Thiel, you wrote zero to one notes on startups or how to build the future. I like the, the use of the word or here because you basically tie the future to startups. Was that intentional? Like I never seen or in a subtitle. Um, yes. Well, it's it's you it's it's certainly um, it's certainly a subset of how to build the future, um, and it's it's a way to um, and it's because the book is meant both for the narrow audience in Silicon Valley of people who are actually working on startups. And then it's also meant for everybody who's concerned about future, which I think should be everybody in, in our, in our society. Who's, uh, uh, who's, who's, who's thoughtful because, uh, the future is something of, of concern to all of us. We're, we're all going to live in it and we want to make it a better future than the present, not a worse one. You know, uh, what about, and, and I, I don't mean to veer off, off at this, but what about someone who's like 50 years old, he's been in a cubicle all his life or her life, and now wants to start something new? Do you think that this also applies to them, like they can learn the skill sets needed to, to move into the future? You know, I, th I think it's always possible to do something new in our society. You know, you can always you can always start over. You can always, you know move to a new city, start a new career. Uh, you know, it's, it's often difficult at different points in time because maybe people have large mortgages, they have large debt, sort of various obligations of one sort or another. But, uh, but I do think, uh, I don't think there's any specific time or uh, place where, where, where you're limited. It's, uh, there, there's certain points where maybe it's a little, you have somewhat more flexibility than other points, but, but there's nothing automatic about it. And, and certainly, you know, if you're 50 years old, uh, you have you have a life expectancy of at least 30 years ahead of you, and so uh, you know you're you 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 know you sh you should you should it would be like crazy to pretend that your life is uh, almost over. Yeah, it's very very good advice. So so zero to one notes on startups or how to build the future, and uh, I, I honestly think this is going to be a best selling book. It's a, it's a really great book. Uh, Peter Thiel, thanks so much for, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, James. It's been a thanks, lot of Peter. fun. Yeah, same here. Bye. Bye. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair, or the Allison Devon, founder of Teespressa, and there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited. Limited.